This is a TLC recording. Silas Marner by George Eliot Part 2 Chapter 16 It was a bright autumn Sunday, 16 years after Silas Marner had found his new treasure on the hearth. The bells of the old Ravelo church were ringing the cheerful peal which told that the morning service was ended. And out of the arched doorway in the tower came slowly, retarded by friendly greetings and questions, the richer parishioners who had chosen this bright Sunday morning as eligible for church-going. It was the rural fashion of that time for the more important members of the congregation to depart first, while their humbler neighbors waited and looked on. Stroking their bent heads or dropping their curtsies to any large ratepayer who turned to notice them. Foremost among these advancing groups of well clad people, there were some whom we shall recognize, in spite of time, who has laid his hand on them all. The tall blond man of forty is not much changed in feature from the Godfrey Cass of six and twenty. He is only fuller in flesh, and has only lost the indefinable look of youth, a loss which is marked even when the eye is undulled and the wrinkles are not yet come. Perhaps the pretty woman, not much younger than he, who is leaning on his arm is more changed than her husband. The lovely bloom that used to be always on her cheek now comes but fitfully with the fresh morning air, or with some strong surprise. Yet to all who love human faces best for what they tell of human experience, Nancy's beauty has a heightened interest. Often the soul is ripened into fuller goodness while age had spread an ugly film, so that mere glances can never divine the preciousness of the fruit. But the years have not been so cruel to Nancy. The firm yet placid mouth, the clear, voracious glance of the brown eyes, speak now of a nature that has been tested and has kept its highest qualities, and even the costume, with its dainty neatness and purity, has more significance now than the coquetries of youth can have nothing to do with it. Mr. and Mrs. Godfrey Cass any higher title has died away from Ravelo lips since the old squire was gathered to his father's and his inheritance was divided, have turned round to look for the tall-aged man and the plainly-dressed woman who are a little behind, Nancy having observed that they must wait for father and Priscilla, and now they all turn into a narrower path leading across the churchyard to a small gate opposite the red house. We will not follow them now. For may there not be some others in this departing congregation whom we should like to see again, some of those who are not likely to be handsomely clad, and whom we may not recognize so easily as the master and mistress of the red house? But it is impossible to mistake Silas Marner. His large brown eyes seem to have gathered a longer vision, as is the way with eyes that have been short-sighted in early life. And they have a less vague, a more answering gaze. But in everything else one sees signs of a frame much enfeebled by the lapse of the sixteen years. The weaver's bent shoulders and white hair give him almost the look of advanced age, though he is not more than five and fifty but there is the freshest blossom of youth close by his side, a blonde, dimpled girl of eighteen, who has vainly tried to chastise her curly auburn hair into smoothness under her brown bonnet. The hair ripples as obstinately as a brooklet under the March breeze, and the little ringlets burst away from the restraining comb behind and show themselves below the bonnet crown. Eppie cannot help being rather vexed about her hair, 
for there is no other girl in Ravelo who has hair at all like it, and she thinks hair ought to be smooth. She does not like to be blameworthy even in small things. You see how neatly her prayer book is folded in her spotted handkerchief. The good-looking young fellow, in a fustian suit, who walks behind her, is not quite sure upon the question of hair in the abstract, when Eppie puts it to him, and thinks that perhaps straight hair is the best in general, but he doesn't want Eppie's hair to be different. She surely divines that there is someone behind her who is thinking about her very particularly, and mustering courage to come to her side as soon as they are out in the lane. Else why should she look rather shy, and take care not to turn away her head from her father Silas, to whom she keeps murmuring little sentences as to who was at church and who was not at church, and how pretty the red mountain ash is over the rectory wall? I wish we had a little garden, father, with double daisies in, like Mrs. Winthrop's, said Eppie, when they were out in the lane. Only they say it'd take a deal of digging and bringing fresh soil. You couldn't do that, could you, father? Anyhow, I shouldn't like you to do it, for it'd be too hard work for you. Yes, I could do it, child, if you want a bit of garden. These long evenings I could work at taking in a little bit of the waste, just enough for a root or two of flowers for you, and again in the morning. I could have a turn with the spade before I sat down to the loom. Why didn't you tell me before as you wanted a bit of garden? I could dig it for you, Master Marner, said the young man in Fustian, who was now by Eppie's side, entering into the conversation without the trouble of formalities. It'll be play to me after I've done my day's work, or any odd bits of time when the work's slack, and I'll bring you some soil from Mr. Cass's garden. He'll let me, and willing. Eh, hey, Aaron, my lad, are you there? said Silas. I wasn't aware of you, for when Eppie's talking of things, I see nothing but what she's a-saying. Well, if you could help me with the digging, we might get her a bit of garden all the sooner. Then, if you think well and good, said Aaron, I'll come to the stone pits this afternoon, and we'll settle what land's to be taken in, and I'll get up an hour earlier in the morning and begin on it. But not if you don't promise me not to work at the hard digging, father, said Eppy, for I shouldn't have said anything about it she added, half bashfully, half roguishly. Only Mrs. Winthrop said as Aaron would be so good and... And you might have known it without Mother telling you, said Aaron. And Master Marner knows too, I hope, as I'm able and willing to do a turn of work for him, and he won't do me the unkindness to anyways take it out of my hands. There now, Father, you won't work in it till it's all easy, said Eppy. It'll be a deal livelier at the stone pits when we've got some flowers, for I always think the flowers can see us and know what we're talking about. And I'll have a bit of rosemary, bergamot, and thyme, because they're so sweet-smelling. But there's no lavender only in the gentlefolks' gardens, I think. That's no reason why you shouldn't have some, said Aaron, for I can bring you slips of anything. I'm forced to cut no end of them when I'm gardening and throw them away mostly. There's a big bed of lavender at the Red House. The missus is very fond of it. Well, said Silas gravely, so as you don't make free for us or ask for anything as is worth much at the Red House, for Mr. Cass's been so good to us and built us up the new end of the cottage and given us beds and things, as I couldn't abide to be imposing for garden stuff or anything else. No, no, there's no imposing, said Aaron. There's never a garden in all the parish but what there's endless waste in it for want of somebody as could use everything up. It's what I think to myself sometimes, as there need nobody run short of victuals if the land was made the most on, and there was never a morsel but what could find its way to a mouth. It sets one thinking of that, gardening does, 
but I must go back now, else mother'll be in trouble as I aren't there. Bring her with you this afternoon, Aaron, said Eppie. I shouldn't like to fix about the garden, and her not know everything from the first. Should you, father? Ay, bring her if you can, Aaron, said Silas. She's sure to have a word to say, as'll help us to set things on the right end. Aaron turned back up the village, while Silas and Eppie went on up the lonely, sheltered lane. Oh, Daddy, she began, when we were in privacy, clasping and squeezing Silas's arm, and skipping round to give him an energetic kiss. My little old Daddy, I'm so glad. I don't think I shall want anything else when we've got a little garden, and I knew Aaron would dig it for us, she went on with roguish triumph. I knew that very well. You're a deep little puss, you are, said Silas, with the mild passive happiness of love-crowned age in his face. But you'll make yourself fine and beholden to Aaron. Oh, no, I shan't, said Eppie, laughing and frisking. He likes it. Come, come, let me carry your prayer book, else you'll be dropping it, jumping that way. Eppie was now aware that her behavior was under observation, but it was only the observation of a friendly donkey browsing with a log fastened to his foot, a meek donkey, not scornfully critical of human trivialities, but thankful to share in them, if possible, by getting his nose scratched, and Eppie did not fail to gratify him with her usual notice, though it was attended with the inconvenience of his following them, painfully, up to the very door of their home. But the sound of a sharp bark inside, as Eppie put the key in the door, modified the donkey's views, and he limped away again without bidding. The sharp bark was the sign of an excited welcome that was awaiting them from a knowing brown terrier, who, after dancing at their legs in a hysterical manner, rushed with a worrying noise at a tortoise-shell kitten under the loom, and then rushed back with a sharp bark again, as much as to say, I have done my duty by this feeble creature, you perceive while the lady mother of the kitten sat sunning her white bosom in the window and looked round with a sleepy air of expecting caresses, though she was not going to take any trouble for them. The presence of this happy animal life was not the only change which had come over the interior of the stone cottage. There was no bed now in the living room, and the small space was well filled with decent furniture, all bright and clean enough to satisfy Dolly Winthrop's eye. The oaken table and three-cornered oaken chair were hardly what was likely to be seen in so poor a cottage. They had come, with the beds and other things, from the red house. For Mr. Godfrey Cass, as everyone said in the village, did very kindly by the weaver. And it was nothing but right a man should be looked on and helped by those who could afford it, when he had brought up an orphan child, and been father and mother to her, and had lost his money too so as he had nothing but what he worked for week by week, and when the weaving was going down too. For there was less and less flax spun, and Master Marner was none so young. Nobody was jealous of the weaver, for he was regarded as an exceptional person, whose claims on neighborly help were not to be matched in Ravelow. Any superstition that remained concerning him had taken an entirely new color, and Mr. Macy, now a very feeble old man of four score and six, never seen except in his chimney corner or sitting in the sunshine at his door sill, was of opinion that when a man had done what Silas had done by an orphan child, it was a sign that his money would come to light again, or leastwise, that the robber would be made to answer for it. For, as Mr. Macy observed of himself, his faculties were as strong as ever. Silas sat down now and watched Eppie with a satisfied gaze as she spread the clean cloth and set on it the potato pie, warmed up slowly in a safe Sunday fashion, by being put into a dry pot over a slowly dying fire as the best substitute for an oven, for Silas would not consent to have a grate and oven added to his conveniences. He loved the old brick hearth, as he had loved his brown pot, 
And was it not there when he had found Epi? The gods of the hearth exist for us still, and let all new faith be tolerant of that fetishism, lest it bruise its own roots. Silas ate his dinner more silently than usual, soon laying down his knife and fork, and watching half-abstractedly Epi's play with Snap and the cat, by which her own dining was made rather a lengthy business. Yet it was a sight that might well arrest wandering thoughts. Epi, with the rippling radiance of her hair and the whiteness of her rounded chin and throat set off by the dark blue cotton gown, laughing merrily as the kitten held on with her four claws to one shoulder, like a design for a jug handle, while Snap on the right hand and Puss on the other put up their paws towards a morsel which she held out of the reach of both, Snap occasionally desisting in order to remonstrate with the cat by a cogent worrying growl on the greediness and futility of her conduct, till Epi relented, caressed them both, and divided the morsel between them. But at last, Epi, glancing at the clock, checked the play, and said, Oh, Daddy, you're wanting to go into the sunshine to smoke your pipe, but I must clear away first, so as the house may be tidy when Godmother comes. I'll make haste, I won't be long. Silas had taken to smoking a pipe daily during the last two years having been strongly urged to it by the sages of Ravelo, as a practice good for the fits. And this advice was sanctioned by Dr. Kimball, on the ground that it was as well to try what could do no harm, a principle which was made to answer for a great deal of work in that gentleman's medical practice. Silas did not highly enjoy smoking, and often wondered how his neighbors could be so fond of it, but a humble sort of acquiescence in what was held to be good had become a strong habit of that new self which had been developed in him since he had found Epi on his hearth. It had been the only clue his bewildered mind could hold by in cherishing this young life that had been sent to him out of the darkness into which his gold had departed. By seeking what was needful for Epi, by sharing the effect that everything produced on her, he had himself come to appropriate the forms of custom and belief, which were the mold of Ravelo life. And as, with reawakening sensibilities, memory also reawakened, he had begun to ponder over the elements of his old faith and blend them with his new impressions, till he recovered a consciousness of unity between his past and present. The sense of presiding goodness and the human trust which come with all pure peace and joy had given him a dim impression that there had been some error, some mistake, which had thrown that dark shadow over the days of his best years, and as it grew more and more easy to him to open his mind to Dolly Winthrop, he gradually communicated to her all he could describe of his early life. The communication was necessarily a slow and difficult process, for Silas's meager power of explanation was not aided by any readiness of interpretation in Dolly, whose narrow outward experience gave her no key to strange customs, and made every novelty a source of wonder that arrested them at every step of the narrative. It was only by fragments and at intervals which left Dolly time to revolve what she had heard till it acquired some familiarity for her, that Silas at last arrived at the climax of the sad story, the drawing of lots, and its false testimony concerning him and this had to be repeated in several interviews, under new questions on her part as to the nature of this plan for detecting the guilty and clearing the innocent. And yourn's the same Bible, you're sure of that, Master Marner, the Bible as you brought with you from that country. It's the same as what they've got at church, and what Eppie's a-learnin' to read in? Yes, said Silas. Every bit the same, and there's drawing a lots in the Bible, mind you. 
he added in a lower tone. Oh, dear, dear, said Dolly in a grieved voice, as if she were hearing an unfavorable report of a sick man's case. She was silent for some minutes. At last, she said, There's wise folks, happen, as know how it all is. The parson knows, I'll be bound, but it takes big words to tell them things, and such as poor folks can't make much out on. I can never rightly know the meaning o' what I hear at church, only a bit here and there, but I know it's good words, I do. But what lies upon your mind? It's this, Master Marner, as if them above had done the right thing by you. They never had let you be turned out for a wicked thief when you was innocent. Ah, said Silas, who had now come to understand Dolly's phraseology. That was what fell on me like as if it had been red-hot iron, because, you see, there was nobody as cared for me or clave to me above nor below, and him as I'd gone out and with for ten year and more, since when we was lads and went halves, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted had lifted up his heel again me, and worked to ruin me. Eh, hey, but he was a bad un. I can't think as there's another such, said Dolly. But I'm o'ercome, Master Marner. I'm like as if I'd waked and didn't know whether it was night or morning. I feel somehow as sure as I do when I've laid something up, though I can't justly put my hand on it, as there was a rights in what you happened to you. If one could but make it out, and you no call to lose heart as you did, but we'll talk on it again for sometimes things come into my head when I'm leeching or poulticing, or such, as I could never think on when I was sitting still. Dolly was too useful a woman not to have many opportunities of illumination of the kind she alluded to, and she was not long before she recurred to the subject. Master Marner, she said one day that she came to bring home Eppie's washing, I've been sore puzzled for a good bit with that trouble o' yorn and the drawing o' lots, and it got twisted backwards and forwards, as I didn't know which end to lay hold on. But it come to me all clear like, that night when I was sitting up with poor Bessie Fox, as is dead and left her children behind, God help em. It come to me as clear as daylight, but whether I've got hold on it now, or can anyways bring it to my tongue's end, that I don't know. For I've got a deal inside me as I'll never come out, and for what you talk of your folks in your old country, never says prayers by heart nor saying them out of a book. They must be wonderful clever, for if I didn't know our father and little bits of good words as I can carry out of church with me, I might down on my knees every night, but nothing could I say." But you can mostly say something as I can make sense on, Mrs. Winthrop, said Silas. Well then, Master Marner, it come to me summit like this. I can make nothing of the drawing a lots, and the answer coming wrong. It had mayhap take the parson to tell that, and he could only tell us in big words. But what come to me as clear as the daylight, it was when I was troubling over poor Bessie Fox and it always came into my head when I'm sorry for folks, and feel as I can't do a power to help em, not if I was to get up in the middle of the night. It comes into my head as them above has got a deal tenderer heart nor what I've got, for I can't be any ways better nor them as made me, and if anything looks hard to me, it's because there's things I don't know on, and for the matter of that, there may be plenty of things I don't know on, for it's little as I know that it is. And so, while I was thinking of that, you come into my mind, Master Marner, and it all come pouring in. If I felt in my inside what was the right and just thing by you, and them as prayed and drawed the lots, all but that wicked un, if they'd had done the right thing by you if they could, isn't there them as was at the making on us, and knows better and as a better will? 
And that's all as ever I can be sure on, and everything else is a big puzzle to me when I think on it. For there was the fever come and took the off them, as were full growed, and left the helpless children. And there's the breaking of limbs, and them as a do right and be sober have to suffer by them as are contrary. Eh, there's trouble in this world, and there's things as we can never do make out the rights on. And all as we've got to do is to trust in Master Marner, to do the right thing as for as we know, and to trust in. For if us as knows so little can see a bit of good and rights, we may be sure as there's a good and a rights bigger nor what we can know. I feel it in my own inside as it must be so. And if you could but had gone on trusting, Master Marner, you wouldn't have run away from your fellow creatures and been so lone. Ah, but that would have been hard, said Silas in an undertone. It would have been hard to trust in them. And so it would, said Dolly, almost with compunction. Them things are easier said nor done, and I'm partly ashamed of talking. Nay, nay, said Silas, you're the right, Mrs. Winthrop. You're in the right. There's good in this world. I've a feeling of that now. And it makes a man feel as there's a good more nor he can see, in spite of the trouble and the wickedness. That drawing a lots is dark. But the child was sent to me. There's dealings with us. There's dealings. This dialogue took place in Eppie's earlier years when Silas had to part with her for two hours every day, that she might learn to read at the dame school, after he had vainly tried himself to guide her in that first step to learning. Now that she was grown up, Silas had often been led in those moments of quiet outpouring which come to people who live together in perfect love, to talk with her, too, of the past, and how and why he had lived a lonely man until she had been sent to him, for it would have been impossible for him to hide from Eppie that she was not his own child, even if the most delicate reticence on the point could have been expected from Ravelo gossips in her presence. Her own questions about her mother could not have been parried, as she grew up, without that complete shrouding of the past, which would have made a painful barrier between their curls for his lost guineas brought back to him. The tender and peculiar love with which Silas had reared her in almost inseparable companionship with himself, aided by the seclusion of their dwelling, had preserved her from the lowering influences of the village talk and habits, and had kept her mind in that freshness, which is sometimes falsely supposed to be an invariable attribute of rusticity. Perfect love has a breath of poetry which can exalt the relations of the least instructed human beings, and this breath of poetry had surrounded Epi from the time when she had followed the bright gleam that beckoned her to Silas's hearth, so that it is not surprising if, in other things besides her delicate prettiness, she was not quite a common village maiden, but had a touch of refinement and fervor which came from no other teaching than that of tenderly nurtured, unvitiated feeling. She was too childish and simple for her imagination to rove into questions about her unknown father. For a long while it did not even occur to her that she must have had a father, and the first time that the idea of her mother having had a husband presented itself to her was when Silas showed her the wedding ring which had been taken from the wasted finger and had been carefully preserved by him in a little lacquered box shaped like a shoe. He delivered this box into Eppie's charge when she had grown up, and she had often opened it to look at the ring, but still she thought hardly at all about the father of whom it was the symbol. Had she not a father very close to her, who loved her better than any real fathers in the village seemed to love their daughters? On the contrary, who her mother was and how she came to die in that forlornness 
were questions that often pressed on Eppie's mind. Her knowledge of Mrs. Winthrop, who was her nearest friend next to Silas, made her feel that a mother must be very precious. And she had again and again asked Silas to tell her how her mother looked, whom she was like, and how he had found her against the furze bush, led towards it by the little footsteps and the outstretched arms. The furze bush was still there, and this afternoon when Eppie came out with Silas into the sunshine, it was the first object that arrested her eyes and thoughts. Father, she said in a tone of gentle gravity, which sometimes came like a sadder, slower cadence across her playfulness. We shall take the furze bush into the garden. It'll come into the corner, and just against it I'll put snowdrops and crocuses, cause Aaron says they won't die out, but I'll always get more and more. Ah, child, said Silas, always ready to talk when he had his pipe in hand, apparently enjoying the pauses more than the puffs. It wouldn't do to leave out the furze bush, and there's nothing prettier, to my thinking, when it's yellow with flowers. But it's just come into my head that we're to do for a fence. Mayhap Aaron can help us to a thought. But a fence we must have, else the donkeys and things will come and trample everything down, and fencing's hard to be got at, by what I can make out. Oh, I'll tell you, Daddy said Eppie, clasping her hands suddenly after a minute's thought. There's lots of loose stones about, some of them not big, and we might lay them atop one of another. And make a wall. You and me could carry the smallest, and Ari'd carry the rest. I know he would. Eh, my precious un, said Silas. There isn't enough stones to go all round. And as for you carrying... Why, with your little arms, you couldn't carry a stone no bigger than a turnip. You're delicate, my, my dear, he added, with a tender intonation. That's what Mrs. Winthrop says. Oh, I'm stronger than you think, Daddy, said Eppy. And if there wasn't stones enough to go all around, why, they'll go part of the way, and then it'll be easier to get sticks and things for the rest. See here, round the big pit? What a many stones! She skipped forward to the pit, meaning to lift one of the stones and exhibit her strength, but she started back in surprise. Oh, father, just come and look here, she exclaimed. Come and see how the water's gone down since yesterday. Why, yesterday the pit was ever so full. Well, to be sure, said Silas, coming to her side. Why, that's the draining they've been on since harvest, in Mr. Osgood's fields, I reckon. The foreman said to me the other day, when I passed by him, Master Marner, he said, I shouldn't wonder if we lay your bit of waste as dry as a bone. It was Mr. Godfrey Cass, he said, had gone into the draining. He'd been taking these fields of Mr. Osgood. How odd it'll seem to have the old pit dried up, said Eppie turning away and stooping to lift rather a large stone. See, Daddy, I can carry this quite well, she said, going along with much energy for a few steps, but presently letting it fall. Ah, you're fine and strong, aren't you? said Silas, while Eppie shook her aching arms and laughed. Come, come, let us go and sit on the bank against the stile there, and have no more lifting. You might hurt yourself, child. You need to have somebody to work for you, and my arm isn't over strong. Silas uttered the last sentence slowly, as if it implied more than met the ear, and Epi, when they sat down on the bank, nestled close to his side, and taking hold caressingly of the arm that was not over strong, held it on her lap, while Silas puffed again dutifully at the pipe which occupied his other arm. An ash in the hedgerow behind made a fretted screen from the sun and threw happy, playful shadows all about them. Father, said Eppie, 
very gently after they had been sitting in silence a little while. If I was to be married, ought I to be married with my mother's ring? Silas gave an almost imperceptible start, though the question fell in with the undercurrent of thought in his own mind, and then said, in a subdued tone, Why, Eppie, have you been a-thinking on it? Only this last week, father, said Eppie, ingenuously, since Aaron talked to me about it. And what did he say? said Silas, still in the same subdued way, as if he were anxious lest he should fall into the slightest tone that was not for Eppie's good. He said he should like to be married, because he was a-going in four and twenty, and had got a deal of gardening work, now Mr. Mott's given up, and he goes twice a week regular to Mr. Cass's, and once to Mr. Osgood's, and they're going to take him on at the rectory. And who is it as he's wanting to marry? Said Silas, with rather a sad smile. Why, me, to be sure, Daddy, said Eppie, with dimpling laughter kissing her father's cheek, as if he'd want to marry anybody else. And you mean to have him, do you? said Silas. Yes, sometime, said Eppie. I don't know when. Everybody's married sometime, Aaron says. But I told him that wasn't true. For, I said, look at father. He's never been married. No, child, said Silas. Your father was a lone man till you was sent to him. But you'll never be lone again, father, said Eppie, tenderly. That was what Aaron said. I could never think of taking you away from Master Marner, Eppie. And I said, it'd be no use if you did, Aaron. And he wants us all to live together. So as you needn't work a bit, father, only was for your own pleasure. And he'd be as good as a son to you. That was what he said. And should you like that, Eppie? Said Silas, looking at her. I shouldn't mind it, father, said Eppie, quite simply. And I should like things to be so as you needn't work much. But if it wasn't for that, I'd sooner things didn't change. I'm very happy. I like Aaron to be fond of me, and come and see us often, and behave pretty to you. He always does behave pretty to you, doesn't he, father? Yes, child, nobody could behave better, said Silas emphatically. He's his mother's lad. But I don't want any change, said Eppie. I should like to go on a long, long while just as we were. Only Aaron does want a change, and he made me cry a bit, only a bit, because he said I didn't care for him, for if I cared for him, I should want us to be married as he did. Eh, my blessed child, said Silas, laying down his pipe as if it were useless to pretend to smoke any longer. You're o'er young to be married. We'll ask Miss Winthrop. We'll ask Aaron's mother what she thinks. If there's a right thing to do, she'll come at it. But there's this to be thought on, Eppie. Things will change, whether we like it or no. Things won't go on for a long while just as they are and no difference. I shall get older and helplesser and be a burden on you. Be like, if I don't go away from you altogether... Not as I mean you'd think me a burden, I know you wouldn't, but it'd be hard on you, and when I look for hard to that, I like to think as you'd have somebody else besides me, somebody young and strong, as'll outlast your own life, and take care on you to the end. Silas paused, and resting his wrists on his knees, lifted his hands up and down meditatively as he looked on the ground. Then, would you like me to be married, father? said Eppie, with a little trembling in her voice. I'll not be the man to say no, Eppie, said Silas emphatically, but we'll ask your godmother. She'll wish the right thing by you and her son, too. There they come, then, said Eppie. Let us go and meet em. Oh, the pipe! 
Won't you have it lit again, father? said Eppy, lifting that medicinal appliance from the ground. Nay, child, said Silas. I've done enough for today. I think, mayhap, a little of it does me more good than so much at once. End of chapter 16. Please click the link below to continue on to chapter 17. This has been a TLC recording. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe.